Because what's the difference between the Marines and being an Amazon seller? The Marines was easier. We went from 100,000 to a million, a million to two million. And we were doubling every year for a number of years. It was an exclusive. And then, you know, fast forward several years, we're really crushing it on Amazon. And then our sales rep calls us almost in tears saying, I'm so sorry. Your exclusives that we gave to you, my boss just gave to Amazon because they threatened to pull all their business if you didn't. If you're not double digit growth rate, 15% or higher, then you're probably doing something wrong. Hey everyone, my name is Shannon Roddy and I'm the business development lead and strategist and educator at Avenue 7 Media. And I have with me today, founder and CEO of Avenue 7 Media and host of the Day 2 podcast, Jason Boyce. Jason Boyce is also the co-author of the Amazon Jungle. Jason, I'm so excited to go through this podcast today and actually talk about the origin story, not only of your backstory, but also of Avenue 7 Media. Yeah, thanks, Shannon. I, I, I'm really looking forward to this. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled about the Day 2 podcast, being uh, uh, partnering with you as we, we help sellers on their journey. And um, like I talk about in the book, The Amazon Jungle, one of the important elements to building a 21st century brand is your origin story and your backstory. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about how all this got started. For most of us, there's a core belief at the center of who we are that sort of drives our values. It, it, it dictates our behavior and ultimately creates the character that we aspire for. What would you say is the one sort of core belief that drives you and has helped make you to be the person that you have come to be? You know, it's a good question. Um, one of the most important traits I find and what I'm attracted to with friends and, and family members is authenticity. Um, and, a, you know, a good, I think a good way to, to illustrate this is a story. So there's this story, you, you've probably heard it before, Shannon, but guy's stuck in a hole. Priest walks by, stops and looks down in the hole and says, hey, man, what's going on? Guy's like, I'm stuck in this hole. Can you help me get out? Priest pulls out a notepad, writes a prayer, drops a prayer down there. And the guy says, what do you mean? There's a prayer's not going to get me out of here. The next guy comes by, it's a doctor. The doctor says, hey, what's going on? He's looking down in the hole and the guy from the hole looks up and says, I'm stuck, help me out. And, and the doctor whips out his prescription pad and writes a prescription and drops it down and says, well, how, how's this going to help? I'm stuck in a hole, man. I can't go to the pharmacy. And then finally, a buddy of his walks by, one of his oldest and dearest friends. His dearest friend looks down, his buddy looks up and says, I'm stuck in a hole, man. Can you help me get out? Friend jumps into the hole with him. And then the friend says, well, what do you mean? What are you doing? Now we're both stuck in a hole. And the friend says, yeah, I know, but I've been in this hole before and I know the way out. And you know, that's kind of the approach. That story sort of illustrates and encapsulates for me how I like to live my life, uh, but also why I wanted to start Avenue 7 Media back when I did. Jason, that's such a cool story. And, and that was actually one of the first things that struck me about you when I heard you speak at Seller Velocity was that authenticity. And I love being a part of a company where I feel like we can all be ourselves. I want to go back to the beginning. There are often situations, there are challenges maybe that we go through in childhood that uniquely form us to help us become the person that we end up becoming. What sticks out in your mind from your early childhood uh, as sort of scenarios or situations that you encountered that felt like those were really transformational or helped form you and become the person that you became? Oh, it's a good question. Um, you know, I like to say about my childhood, it was easier than some, harder than others. And, and I think that's probably fair with most people when they, when they talk about their childhood. I, it wasn't necessarily idyllic. Uh, you know, at an early age, it, you know, just before my seventh birthday, I lost my 18 month old sister to a terrible accident that my dad was involved in. And, and I think more than any other event in my childhood, that one event, that one sort of horrific event formed uh, who I was and who I became. It, you know, it certainly formed a lot of my pathology that I needed to correct with 20 years of therapy later on in life. Uh, sure. But it also just sort of uh, put an extra emphasis on meaning. Whatever I do, whether it's at work or, or um, you know, in my personal life, I, I'm really drawn to things and events that I can do that, that actually have impact and, 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 and change meaning. And I think it goes all the way back to that, that terrible loss. And, it, you know, lots of families have, have had a lot of loss and, um, you know, it's what you do after that loss that, that can, that can make or break you. Um, you know, also I, I had a dad who I always was trying to please. He was, he was a big, strong, uh, uh, self-employed, not manual labor, but say middle-class, uh, uh, em employment person. So I was around entrepreneurship as you will, 
but you know, he was an alcoholic. He was tough. He, you know, he was, he, he could be abusive at times. And, um, you know, I think people who grew up with that kind of a background, they, they tend to try to please, you know, they're pleasers. They always want to make people happy. And so I, I know that it's part of my pathology. And I think it's one of the reasons why we're so focused and intent on taking care of our, our of our clients is because we want so much for them to love what we do for them. And, you know, the, it, it, these are, Shannon, these are uncomfortable stories to share. Uh, you know, I share some of it in, in, in my book, uh, the Amazon jungle, because again, it's part of that origin story. It's part of building that, that unique brand in the marketplace. And, uh, you know, th- thanks for asking the questions. It's not easy to talk about it, but I think, um, you know, specifically to your point, these are definitely things that shape who I am. It, it, it creates an extra inner drive to do well, not only for myself, but more importantly for others. And it's part of that authenticity. I mean, it is the real story. You know, the other part that you mentioned is, you know, certainly there's childhood trauma and challenge and tragedy. But as Viktor Frankl says in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, if there is, you know, if there is no meaning in suffering, there is no meaning. And so that That's ability right. to, to dig deep and find that is the most powerful thing I think we can do in hum- uh, as humans. Um, well, and you know, Shannon, one thing's for sure. Amazon applies a lot of suffering to sellers that I've learned from <laughs> over the years. And so, you know, so maybe we should thank Amazon for that because it's, it's adding character, <laughs> right? It's, it's building character as part of uh, what we do here. So yeah, Victor Frankel, what an amazing book. I've read it, I think six times. It's a, it's a great piece of work. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Fast forwarding, uh, you go to school. Um, first of all, did you go to college? You know, in this day and age, entrepreneurship does not require a college degree. Did you go to college? And if so, what did you end up studying? I did. You know, I, I have what's called the Tommy Boy degree. It took me eight years to get a four-year degree. If you go, if for those of you who don't know or haven't watched the movie Tommy Boy, uh, you know, oh, a lot of people take eight years to graduate from college, yeah, and then the, the smart, his smart ass friend says, "Yeah, they're called doctors." Yeah, well, I'm not a doctor. I just have a bachelor's of science and it's in uh, um, a business administration uh, skills aside. I think it's, I think going to college and getting that college degree is, 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 is still important. Although I certainly don't judge those who become amazing developers or graphic designers or whatever, and just skip the college experience. I, I just, uh, I just look back on my years of college, all eight of them <laughs> and uh, I look back at them fondly. Yeah, I was an English communication major, which I think at the end of the day means I can communicate in English, hopefully. So I think that's, <laughs> what, I, that's what I got out of it. So um, now post-college at some point, you actually enrolled in the Marines and and volunteered to serve. And on behalf of our listeners and viewers, I personally want, I want to thank you for that service. Tell us what that journey was like and what were some of the lessons that you took away from your time in the Marines that you have applied successfully to your life and business? Yeah. Th- thanks for that, Shannon. I, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, I, I just did one tour. I did four years. I, I was actually walking around Cal State Northridge campus and I had a lot of energy back then, Shannon. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I liked physical activity. I couldn't sit still in a chair very long. And so the idea of going to work in an office immediately following my business degree was, was terrifying to me. And, uh, you know, I, as good as my business degree was from Cal State Northridge, I, I felt that I wanted to learn more about leadership. Uh, It's another area that I'm passionate about. Um, And I was walking around campus one day and I saw um, by the bookstore, the cover on Inc. Magazine had this Marine in a dress blue uniform. Uh, You know, I later learned that it was a Lieutenant Colonel and the head and the title said the best management training program in America. And so I grabbed it. I read the article and the next day I walked down and signed up for the Marine Corps. The specific program that they were referencing in the article was officer candidate school, followed by something called the basic school in the Marine Corps. And it is intense. You know, that first 10 weeks, they try to get you to quit um, right. and, and try to wear you out. Um, so, so that wasn't a very fun experience, but meaningful. But that, that learning that I got from the basic school where the Marines teach in the way that they know how, uh, what's important about leadership, the concept of leading from the front, um, the concept of your people, developing your people, taking care of your people and driving them to success. The Marine Corps was an amazing experience uh, for me personally. It was a pretty incredible experience that I used in order to develop a business. And then also I, I, I still use, I mean, I, you know, Shannon, I bring up some of these leadership lessons that I learned in the Marines sometimes when we're talking internally to our key leadership team, because they're just, you know, they transcend the military and they're, and they're, they're you know, as prescient today as they were when I was there, you know, decades ago. Yeah. How to take a hill. 
take that hill and That's right. freedom and autonomy to do it in the way that makes the most sense with the fewest number of resources. Absolutely. Right okay. Now at some point you finish your tour of duty and you go into business with your brothers. I, I don't have brothers, so I have no idea what that's like. What was that like for you? Yeah, well, look, these are these are my my adopted brothers. My Jewish family here in um, in Los Angeles took me in in my late teens when I was a problem child trying to sort through some things, and uh, became they, they became my my Jewish family. Um, and so my brothers, when I, I was just about to get out of the Marines, maybe three weeks, I said, "Look, I'm getting out. I don't really know what I'm going to do." I had gone through the recruiting thing. I was interviewing for you know, pharmaceutical companies and big corporate America, ones that try to hire for, for junior leaders and, uh, came home for Saturday, uh, lunch with uh, my family. And my brother Ari said, I mean, Hey man, I'm starting a business. And Ari was like, let's just, let's just put this kindly. Ari was like the stoner in the family and had, you know, <laughs> had the long hair and, you know, always had bloodshot eyes going to the table. And so I was intrigued and everyone was like, Oh, that's so cute. Ari's going to start a business. And I was like, tell me more, right? I wanted to hear everything. And right. um, literally after that lunch, we became partners at that moment. I said, look, I'm out in three weeks. I'll get my last paycheck. What do we need to buy first? And, and Ari's idea was to start a basketball uh, website where you, you sell basketball hoops, like the ones that you see in your driveway or the ones that you put in the ground. And um, he figured out this dropship model, this just-in-time just inventory model. He had become one of his friends at the restaurant that he was working at, um, had figured out how to sell ping pong tables. And so, you know, taught him, you know, how to get started. And so left the Marines and we jumped right in. I, I did take a job at Johnson and Johnson where I met my wife. Uh, but, but I, it was a short term gig from the time I started. I just wanted some sales experience and some income <laughs> so that we could build up this business called superduperhoops.com. Now, at some point, Amazon actually approached you. What was that initial conversation like? Yeah, it was crazy. They, they actually called it. They used a telephone to call me, uh, if you can believe that, Shannon. Um, Back in the day. Yeah. So my brother had another relationship with a company called Overture out of Pasadena that invented mm -hmm. pay-per-click advertising. So we were all over the first page of all the search engines of the time. Um, it wasn't just Google. Um, there were, you know, half a dozen big search engines out there and we were all over the first page for selling basketball hoops. And so clearly the biz dev person at Amazon who had just launched the sports and outdoors category was looking to add categories, saw our product everywhere on the internet and called us and said, we want you to sell your products on our website. I was like, dude, what are you talking about? I just bought a VHS tape from you guys. What do you mean you're selling sporting <laughs> goods? I had no idea. They were doing it. They were still a bookseller and they were dabbling into uh, electronics. Not, and stuff not like yet the everything store. No, not yeah. even close. And, and so, yeah, they, they called and my, my brothers and I, the, you know, the four of us were, two of us were like, let's do this right now. I was one of them. And the others were like, they're going to kill us. And I said, both may be true, but we need to do this now because this is an opportunity to align ourselves with a really well-known e-commerce brand and we can learn a lot from it. And, you know, sort of the, sort of the rest is history from there. Yeah. Now, whether it was a specific instance or maybe your duration, what was the most positive thing that you got out of that experience selling on Amazon that you sort of look back and take away as like, that was really, really positive and impactful? You know, there were a lot of things that I complained about early on, especially at Amazon as they continued to raise the bar. I'm talking about the early years. I'm, I'm going to exclude the last six or seven years, which have been particularly challenging for sellers in a lot of ways, Shannon, but like, you know, 2003 till 2000, let's say 15, 14, I would get, I would really get mad every time they would raise the bar. But ultimately when I was able to set my ego aside and say, okay, is this better for my consumer? Is this better for the Amazon shopper? Ultimately the answer was always yes. And so yeah. as painful as, and as some of those changes were, that they required us to do in order to meet the demands of their consumers, they were incredibly informative. It helped me and my brothers look at this game of e-commerce in the way that Amazon was. And um, their sort of customer obsession really rubbed off on us in a way that, that became gospel for us within our own office that, hey, we, we have to do whatever it takes to make the Amazon customer. And we had our own customers as well. We were selling in multiple channels, including our own website. Sure. Um, that we would go and be above and beyond, even if it had short-term economic pain 
because we were building relationships with our customers. So I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah. That, that relationship with the customer is really critical. And I appreciate the lessons I have learned over the last 20 years from Amazon in that regard. Now, I know you talk about some of these in the book, The Amazon Jungle, which is available not ironically, on Amazon. Um, hey, but if you hate Amazon, you can also get it at Barnes & Noble, Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> what was one of the most painful experiences? If there was sort of one that was singled out, or maybe it was sort of a duration period of this constant challenge, right? Because there's sort yeah. of two ways we experience trauma. It's, it's low duration, high intensity, or high duration, low intensity. What was one that sort of sticks out for you that a lot of our listeners would probably relate to? I think there was a lot of high duration... D duration high intensity too, Shannon. Um, yeah, there, <laughs> I, I, I think I'm going to introduce a new level of trauma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, my standard joke is what's the difference between the Marines and being an Amazon seller? The Marines was easier. Um, right. It's just sort of longer <laughs> lasting, the pain intervals when you're dealing with, with Amazon. But when I look back at my career as a seller, which was 17 years, became a top 200 seller early on and stayed there for the majority of my time as a seller. Um, there were three phases that, that are distinctly painful. When they called me and we launched, we were just a drop shipper. We didn't carry inventory. You know, life was so good. Um, we would do these great listings. We would sell it. We would then send it to the manufacturer or the, or the distributor, and they would directly ship it to the customer. You know, right. very easy projection wise, easy cash flow. We went from a hundred thousand to a million, a million to 2 million. We were doubling every year for a number of years. And then one day we woke up and Amazon had taken our listings that we had created for the product that they had asked us to sell on Amazon.com and attached their own listing. That was the first indication of this thing called the buy box. Right. I, I learned about the buy box when all of my sales dried up because Amazon attached to our listings in the buy box and offered the products that we were selling for 30% less uh, than many times less than our cost. Um, at the end of that, that could have been the end of our journey on Amazon. We could have just folded up the tent and said, screw this, let's go get a job or start something else. But we, we, um, I'll, I'll use Spalding as an example that I use often and often we were drop shipping a lot of Spalding product. Spalding started selling to Amazon. We, we were the largest e-commerce seller of Spalding equipment for a number of years. They used to invite us to the NBA all-star game and put us up in the Ritz and all these great things. It was, it was a really good relationship. So when Amazon kneecapped our dropship business, we went back to Spalding and said, look, we like you guys. You guys like us. We've done a lot of business. We've done millions of dollars in sales over the last many years. Um, you know, We like product X, but if you tweak it a, a little bit and give it to us as product Y with a unique UPC code, unique SKU, we think we can get back all that sales you just gave a, handed over to Amazon. So give us a shot. Right. And so that's what I would call phase two, our exclusives phase, which continued right up into the point of exit. Wow. And so that really taught me the power of the buy box. If 20 other people are in the buy box, it's really hard to maintain profitability, sales, price, ranking, all that stuff. Everything. And, yeah. and so by, by entering into this exclusive relationship with, with Amazon and Spalding, um, we doubled our revenue. We did even more sales. So we were growing rapidly and we had what we thought <laughs> was an exclusive. And then, you know, fast forward several years, we're really crushing it on Amazon. And then our sales rep calls us almost in tears saying, I'm so sorry. Your exclusives that we gave to you, my boss just gave to Amazon because they threatened to pull all their business if we didn't. And and so that was a gut punch, right? So that was like phase two gut punch. And that's and that's the Amazon eight thousand pound gorilla, right? It's not eight hundred pounds; it's eight thousand pounds. Yeah, probably eight million pounds. Yeah, it's, it's really not big. operating in the best interest <laughs> of the seller. You know, so. that's right. That's right. So that was like phase. That was like phase two. And again, Shannon, we could have folded the tent. We could have shut down. And, and moved on, but we had gotten a taste for what it was like to take a product and improve it and make it better with the exclusives. Yeah. So we're like, screw this, let's, let's make our own product. And I had no idea how to make our own product. I certainly, when I started in 2002, had no intention of developing and making our own products. I didn't know the first thing about it. And that's where the real magic on Amazon happened. You know, I got a plane ticket to Hong Kong, a train ticket into, into Guangzhou, the trade show there, didn't know anything about anything and just started this long journey of figuring out how to design, develop, and source products with our own brand name so that we could 100% control the channel and who was selling. So that was like the third, the third episode. There's really a fourth, which I probably should talk about. We developed really cool, unique products in the, in the, in the marketplace. And, and we did that 
because we looked at our customer demographics. We thought we were the man cave company with our basketball right. hoops and our air hockey tables and you know all these cool billiard tables and everything. We thought we were the man the, the man cave company. And then we took a look at the demographics of our customers. We, we used at the time, there, there was no brand analytics at the time. So we just took all of our customers, including Amazon's, uh, which we weren't supposed to do, but we sent them to, to um, a list broker and they reverse engineered and told us about who our clients were, who were buying our products. And we were floored by the results. We almost didn't believe them. The majority of our customers were moms right. and they lived in the suburbs with really big homes. They all had like high-end credit cards and they were outside of the cities. And so we were like, we're doing this all wrong, guys. We need to speak to the consumers. So we came in and all, they were very like testosterone heavy man designs, right? Time to all the yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, all of it was, was out there. I mean, some of it was like 80s style, some of it was really bad stuff. <laughs> and so we came in with our brand and said, we're gonna, we're gonna create gender neutral designs. We're gonna speak to moms. We're gonna make moms proud of their game room in their basement or wherever else that they are. And, um, you know, we're going to create something that speaks to them. And our business took off, just absolutely wow. took off. And on the search results page, we had these unique colors that were gender neutral that really exploded off of the search results page. And then sort of the final phase for us before exit was, <laughs> you know, we, we, we show, you know, I'm looking at the search results page right before the holiday season. And we did 40% of our business in November and December. And I'm doing searches for air hockey, foosball, all these different tables that we sell. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. And I see a listing for a product that says sold, see more from our brands on Amazon. And it was literally the exact same Pantone colors and color scheme of our game tables. And I said, you know, five or six few choice words at that point. And I was like, what's next? Yeah. You know, I mean, at the time we had our exit, Shannon, and we had an exit at the time we had our exit, we were growing at 180% year over year, our private label brand, because we were speaking to the right customer in the right way, playing the Amazon game, the way Amazon wants you to play it. And then they started uh, replicating our products. Now we still kick their ass yeah. and I'm, I'm convinced yeah. we would continue to do so because Amazon's not great at iterating, but, but still that was, whew, that's 17 years in a nutshell, Shannon, it's a lot of information but yeah. that's, that's been the, that was the journey, man. That was the painful, long journey that was both equally rewarding and then also could be incredibly frustrating uh, throughout that, that, well, that that's, story. That's the, that's the phrase amateurs bar professionals steal, you know, taken to the very <laughs> ethical extremes, you know, of, um, you know, what, what is okay to borrow yeah. by inspiration versus completely rip, rip somebody off. Um, yeah, you know, it's a great point. I mean, I borrowed design ideas from the snowboard industry, the skateboard industry, the surf industry, you know, all these that's industry designs. Yeah. So that's borrowing, right? In my mind. Now we took them and we repurposed them for our needs. Sure. With air hockey and, sure. and billiard tables and all that stuff. But boy, to just to just totally copy the exact same designs that cost money, time, creativity, and innovation and energy to create and, and replicate them. Uh, it pisses me off to this day and it, it makes me angry every time I see one of our clients, especially get ripped off by sure. those brands. There's just no reason for it. And frankly, they don't need to do that. They just don't need to. Uh, so yeah. it's one of those things. It's always a head scratcher. I wish they'd stop, but you know, now, Grace, that's the 8 million pound gorilla yeah. in action. Now, Jason, you gave a great talk at seller velocity, which I attended and absolutely loved. It was one of the first times I got to hear you speak. Um, and you talked about the talk was actually on exits. Look, we're in an age of Amazon aggregators that is going just ballistics. <laughs> so if there's, yeah. and I know some of the brands and people listening are either having those conversations, they're entertaining those thoughts, they're asking questions about their own exit. There's too much to get into for all of that. But if you had one piece of, of leave away advice or one piece of advice for uh, our audience listening in regards to exit specifically, what would that be? The real thing is you, you have to be different and unique in the marketplace. You have to provide value that's different and unique and you need to be growing. The more you can grow, growth growth of in top line can cover up and mask a lot of problems and issues that you may or may not have in your business. And you can make less money on the bottom line if your growth rate is high enough. It means that you've struck a nerve, you're 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 offering something that's unique in the marketplace. And, and you're growing and the market is rewarding you as a result of, of that identification. So I think, I think that is absolutely critical when it comes to an exit. 
sure. uh, high growth rate. And, and, in, and in today's day and age, if you're not double digit growth rate, 15% or higher, yeah. then you're probably doing something wrong. Um, if you can be profitable, uh, you know, above the break even level. But if you start, if you're growing at 180% like we were, you don't have to necessarily be that profitable. Just don't be losing money. Um, those are some metrics that that folks look at. And it's sort of a sliding scale. Sure. The faster your growth, the lower you need to make in money. The slower your growth, you better be making a lot more in money. Right. Uh, but again, what holds up and props up those two metrics, the sales and the, and the profit metrics are where are you in the marketplace? Where are you different? Are you differentiated enough? Have you built enough of a branding moat and sprinkled the pixie dust over your brand enough to let consumers know that this is unique, this is special, and it's valuable? So Jason, you exit your business and you're asking yourself, what do I do next? You have all this incredible Amazon experience. You love um, helping other people. You love finding meaning and purpose and suffering. And you mentioned that story at the beginning of I've been in the hole before. I know how to get out of it. Um, and that led to you doing some consulting. What what did that look like in it, its initial iteration? What led you to start doing consulting with other brands and sellers on Amazon? Um, great. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, when I first got an inkling that I wanted to be either a consultant or an agency owner was at the very first Prosper show in Salt Lake City. Uh, I was, uh, James Thompson invited me to be on a couple of panels. Uh, I was able to share my information and I got mobbed afterwards with questions. Sure. Sure. And, you know, I had, a, you know, one time the, the, there was such a mob after one of the panel discussions and people were so hungry, which is why I'm so grateful to James for starting that show. People were so hungry for information that, uh, you know, the host said, can you guys move out in the hallway because we need <laughs> right. to start the next session and no one can hear. So, you know, we went out. We went out in the hallway and I was just like sort of answering questions. Next one, next one, next one. And it was so fun and meaningful. Yeah. And I felt it, it made me feel really good that a lot of the pain and suffering that I had suffered and learned from was providing value for these folks. Yeah. And I connected with them and I loved it. And so that was like the first inkling that, you know, I, I wanted to do something different than just build another brand. Secondly, okay. speaking of brands, some of my happiest times building my previous seller business was when it was time to rebrand or it was time to study and identify holes in the marketplace to create new products and, and new branding. But what, what always happened, Shannon, is once the new brand was done, I had like, I, I entered into like a period of depression yeah. because I knew I couldn't do it again. I just yeah. had to wait until, you know, That's years really down the road <laughs> when it was time for the next one. So I learned those two things about my th myself. Number one, I loved helping others. And it was clear based on the looks on their faces with the answers that I was, I was able to offer value. And that just feels good. You know? Yeah. Um, and then the second thing was, man, I love, I love finding the story of a brand and telling it. And it's something that we do at Avenue seven media like every Talk. week. Yeah. And I love it. And I love talking to the owners and I love being able to help them. And I love creating new and exciting brands because at our core, we really are sort of a mini branding agency. And so th those are things that I, that I really loved. Yeah. And then you know, the final thing that I'll say in terms of consulting, I'm not a great consultant, Shannon. <laughs> and here's why. <laughs> Amazon is so hard and so different that you know better than anybody because you're a sure. consultant. You have to do 150 things. You mm -hmm. can't just do a thing. And so where I got frustrated is I talked to some brands and said, look, I'll be, I'll, I'll, you know, let's have a couple hours a month. I'll tell you what you need to do. We'll come back the next month. It'll be done and your life will be so much better. But what I found was business owners are busy especially multi-channel. They're, right. they're trying to de design the next product. They're trying to run their business. They're trying to keep their lights on. They don't have time to also stop what they're doing and then come in and do Amazon as well. And, and so at one point, one of the brands, I, I don't even remember what it was, but I was like, forget it. I, you guys are buried. Just give it to me. Let me yep. do it. I'll hire the team and the staff. We will do this and we will take it off your plate and we will become your fully outsourced Amazon department. And, and one of the brands was like, thank you. Thank you so much. He was like in tears, You're right? Streaming down I his wanted face, to do it, but say. I can't do it. Right. And so that was kind of, that was kind of the story. And, um, based on those early consulting relationships, we, we started an agency and you know, the rest is history. Speaking of those 150 things, uh, we've got a checklist. We'll share the link. Uh, at the end in the notes and everything. But Jason and I have actually worked together to outline all of those things that you actually need to do. And it's 
a lot. <laughs> it is exhausting. And when we when we did our final cut and our final edit on that list, which by the way is free to all of you, you yeah. know, go, go go to day two podcast.com and download it for free. I was thinking back, Shannon, to 2006 mm-hmm. and thinking that list would have been a third or a fourth of the size in 2006 five compared things, to what it five in things you need to do. Yeah. 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 It wouldn't have been very big. Uh, but it was, uh, I really enjoyed doing that project with you. And I'm, I'm happy that we can offer that, that, that free giveaway to our followers and listeners. A hundred percent. Okay. So at that point you started Avenue seven, for, first of all, briefly, where did the name Avenue seven media come from? I can take zero credit for it. Although I love the name. I, I had put together a list of names that I thought would be good for the agency. And my wife, Anne, who's a marketer in her own right and has been so for about 20 years herself, she, we, were, we were at dinner and I was like, okay, I was so proud of these names, right? I, I started going down the list of names and she was like, mm, eh, mm, <laughs> right? I'm like, what? These are great names. And she's like, I, I love you, Jay, but these are terrible names. And then she just, off the top of her head, she goes, what about Avenue 7? Simple, and I was like, "Shit, clean. that's better than all mine combined." That is a great name, <laughs> uh, and, and, and it was my wife. She deserves full credit for the name Avenue Seven. I added, I ended up adding media because Avenue Seven was owned by uh, a plus size women's apparel company, and I couldn't use it for our purposes. So I added Avenue Seven Media, and I also knew, and I know, that we will continue to ex- expand our capabilities beyond Amazon. And so thought it was a good name, and. You know, I, I really love it. I'm proud of it. And, and thank you, honey, for giving us that great name that we use every we day. We married now. up, Jason. We married up. Um, <laughs> we did. We now, definitely did. Now, uh, the current Avenue 7 Media president, Dale Dabbs, you guys had known each other through a coaching, uh, CEO coaching uh, group for many, many years. And yeah. you said what I said when I met Dale, which is, I want to be like Dale when I grow up. Um, because he's <laughs> just such an incredible man of humility, of character, of leadership. He has more decades of leadership experience, um, you know, exponentially more than I do. And he was one of the biggest reasons that I wanted to to join Avenue 7 was to learn from to learn from Dale. Um, He just had an incredible exit, um, took a company from about, you know, uh, one to to 100 million plus and had an exit to TransUnion um, in 2021. And he told me at the conference, he said, "Yeah, just a little exit, Shannon, six hundred and forty million dollar exit to TransUnion, just um, just a mite." Um, <laughs> so he he did not need work after that at that point. But he told me, "No," he said, "Shannon," he said, "Jason Boyce is the only person on the planet that I would have come out of retirement for." That said a lot. I mean, first of all, it's a huge compliment to you and to your relationship. It speaks well to that. But I thought, holy cow, if this guy's had an exit like that and is willing to come out of retirement for one person, that's something that I really want to be a part of. And that's where I actually started those conversations with you and Angela Murphy, our COO, and Dale about being acquired as Marketplace Seller Courses because I knew what you had discovered, which is you can tell people everything they need to do and give them all the information and they still do not have the time, the team, the energy, the resources to go out and do it because of the increasing complexity of Amazon. But, you know, Dale came on, but it wasn't just him. It, he actually sort of brought on a bigger and larger team that had all worked together. Talk a little bit about that synergy because we're not just talking about, hey, let's get together and try this. They know how to take agencies through this transformational growth process that we're pursuing and so excited about because we know it means we can help more sellers. Yeah, I mean, I we need to, we need to have Dale on the podcast to just, tap into his incredible uh, experience as a manager. Dale's what I call an entre- one of the best entrepreneurial managers and leaders, specifically that word leaders. You know, my, my time in the Marine made me a student of leadership to this day. And Dale's just one of the most effective leaders I've ever met in my entire career. Sure. Um, you know, we, we, we met through the Inc. CEO project. Pam Singleton is our, is our group leader. And you're right. I just, Every time I left one of those meetings, I wanted to spend more and more time with Dale. So when he retired, I was like, oh, no, 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 you don't, sir. Come on, <laughs> come, come on, let's do this. And I think, you know, I don't want to speak for Dale, but I think one of the things that's so attractive about Avenue 7 Media, and I appreciate what he says about me, and, and he and I do have a, a wonderful friendship, and, but I, I think what attracts Dale to Avenue 7 Media is every single day we get out of bed and we go to work for entrepreneurs. 
for, for sellers, for brand owners, for small business people. Mm-hmm. And Dale and I, and I know you do too, Shannon, we absolutely share this passion for the innovators, for the people who are out there bringing new solutions to market. And we've all been there. We've all done that. And it's just incredibly meaningful for us, all of us, to be able to help those kinds of brands and sellers. So I think, look, I, you know, I, I love working with Dale because not only does he, is he a great manager and effective leader, he's funny. He's really funny. And he, yeah. either, every time I'm on a call with him, I'm like almost falling out of my chair laughing because he's got such a great sense of humor. And thankfully, Dale was able to bring in our COO, uh, amazing COO, Angela Murphy, and Daryl LaFoon, our CTO, who um, were part of that journey that they took Sontic from you know a million to two million all the way up to 100 million and amazing exit. And they've all been working together so long that they finish each other's sentences. And I just feel lucky to be able to sit in the room with them, our executive team, whenever we're making strategic decisions, because each and every one of them uh, brings such a unique perspective. And um, we all share the same passion. We're here for sellers. We're here for brand owners. We want to change their lives like small business and entrepreneurship has changed each and every one of our lives. And that's our passion and mission every day. Our goal, our mission, right, is to improve the lives of brands and sellers. And we do that not only through the agency work, but you're also a huge advocate uh, outside of the agency work uh, on behalf of sellers, whether it's talking to the media, talking to our political representatives to ensure that the rights really at, at a base level, the rights of sellers are protected. Anything that you want to share on that aspect of the vision as a whole and what it what it means to you personally? Yeah, I mean, what came to mind as we were drafting that vision is that we're not really an Amazon agency. Right. Sure. Most of our clients are Amazon sellers, right? But if you think about it and you look back in, in, in history, when has there been an agency with so much responsibility for the success of a brand on any sales channel as there is right now? Sure, there's been manufacturers agents who will make a relationship. There's marketers who will buy digital media and help you convert. There's, um, you know, and, there's, and then there's the whole suite of services that go under driving traffic and converting sales on a dot-com website. But I don't think ever in history has there been an agency quite like what the Amazon agency space has created. And frankly, I think it's the future. And yeah. so the reason why we're not an Amazon agency, even though we help brands succeed and flourish on Amazon is because I can't tell you how many times, Shannon, and you know this better than I do, how many times a client comes to us and says, we love the listings that you created and the branding that you did for us so much. We want to use it on our Shopify store or our big commerce store. Is that okay? And we're like, hell yeah, take it, use it. And eventually we'll have internal teams available to do that work for them. But in the meantime, we just want to get to the core of the story. And we're a branding agency first. Not only are we going to give strategy and advice, but we're going to operate and we're going to execute for you. So I think it really is a unique kind of of business service industry that's been created as a result of Amazon. And I just wanted to double down on it uh, with that mission statement. And it just just felt right as it flowed off the pen. Once you can get Amazon, because Amazon is the most sophisticated and complex, you can dominate everything else. And people ask us all the time, can you help us with our Shopify? Can you help us with our Walmart? And initially, it, you know, it may seem overwhelming, but it makes sense. If you understand how to tell the story on Amazon, you can tell that story on social media. You can tell that story through your DTC website. You can tell, I mean, all of those different pieces, um, even in, in brick and mortar display and product packaging, all of those things are a translation of the story. So look, guys, if you have not had a chance to read it yet, check out the Amazon Jungle uh, on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, wherever books are sold. If you'd like to grab that free Amazon Seller Central checklist, go to day2podcast.com and you can download it for free there. Again, that's day2podcast.com to get the complete uh, Amazon Seller Central checklist. Jason, I want to thank you so much, obviously, for taking the time to share your story, um, to share the uh, origin, the background of Avenue 7 Media. It's an honor for me to be a part of it. I'm super excited as I know our our entire leadership and our entire team is. Um, And so if people have, whether the viewers or listeners want to learn more or want to ask us about the work that we do with brand owners, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, Well, thank you, Shannon. And truthfully, the honor is mine. And and we are so thrilled and happy to have you as part of the Avenue 7 team with our mission as we continue to go forth and help change the lives of sellers and brand owners. Uh, If you want to learn more about how our experienced team of Amazon operators can help you and your brand, uh, you can go to the Day 2 podcast. That's Day 
the number two podcast.com and uh shannon or or, or, or some of our, our our folks will reach out to you get to know your brand a little bit and see if we can help you and if we can't help you we'll let you know as well but yeah thank you shannon thanks for all your kind words thanks for being part of this amazing team and uh we'll see you on the next episode thanks jason